Welcome to Chautauqua People. My name is John V. My guest today is Laura Damon. Lauren is best known as the convener of North Lake Informed Citizens. She was born in Buffalo. She went to college at Smith and then served in the Peace Corps, afterwards returned to the States and earned a graduate degree at Yale. And she uh, had a career teaching at Niagara Community College and at Niagara University. Now, Laura, I understand you had some very remarkable experiences as an undergraduate that led directly into your Peace Corps experience. I wonder if you could tell us about this. Pure dumb luck. It was a beautiful May night, my junior year. I should have been studying for final exams. And I looked at the calendar to see if there was something else going on <laughs> so I didn't have to study. And Dr. Gwendolyn Carter was having a meeting of people who might be interested in going to Africa with her the following summer, not the immediate summer, but a year from that evening. And uh, I went, and when I got home, I told my parents about it, and they said, wow, that sounds quite interesting, but we'd like to meet Miss Carter. And they did, and uh, in the summer of 1959, I spent two glorious months with her and th 13 other women. Uh, so we started in England, talking in the colonial office about when independence would be granted to the several countries that we were going to be visiting, uh, just to show how out of connection the, the colonial office was, they said, in 10 years if they behave themselves. And the big year was the following year, 50, well, actually 59, 60, 61 were big years for independence in Africa. We went from England down the East Coast, ended up in South Africa, and uh, Dr. Carter had, had organized each stop so that we had meals in the homes of residents there. Um, often white, but often black as well. Uh, we were taken to game parks or the local attraction, and there was still uh, free time for shopping, mm -hmm. which women needed, I guess. <laughs> uh, when we got to South Africa, uh, we were on our own for about three days, which was very unusual. She really had a rather tight schedule, but she was not in evidence, and we asked, there were uh, two people who were her caretakers because Dr. Carter had been stricken with polio at the age of three. So she was either on crutches or in a wheelchair for her entire life. Uh, you would talk with her and totally forget she was incapacitated in any way. Mm -hmm. So, but we were concerned that she was absent for three days and we kept hounding the caretakers, where is she? Oh, she's all right, don't worry about her. When we were out of South Africa, we were told by Dr. Carter herself that she had gone into the bush uh, with escorts and met with Nelson Mandela for an entire day. And this was the year that he was arrested and, and jailed for a long time. What an astonishing woman uh, to have made that connection, to be invited by Mandela uh, to, to come and visit and get the insight. I not only fell in love with her as a role model, but with uh, the whole idea of Africa. Um, and so when uh, several years later, Kennedy announced the, the Peace Corps, I raced down to the post office in Buffalo, New York, and took the entrance exam. And uh, I was working at that time at the Buffalo Downtown Library. and. My dad was out of town on business, and, and mother, uh, who was somewhat frail, had an asthma attack the night before. And I told her if I was sorry about that, but if she didn't get a doctor's appointment, I was not going to sympathize very much. So she promised that she would. And the phone, uh, I got a phone call at about noon, knowing that was my lunch hours when she chose to call. And she said, are you sitting down? I thought, oh my gosh something serious medical is going on. And I said, um, yeah. She said, well, I have in my hand a telegram. You've been accepted to go in the Peace Corps. Yowie. <laughs> 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 there was a, a typo in, in the telegram. I was accepted to go to C-H-A-N-A. -A, and that's what all of those of us who 
uh, went in training to go to Ghana, had received, we didn't know whether we were going to China or Ghana, but what the heck, we wanted to be in the Peace Corps. Right. So, uh, and on top of that confusion, we had four days to quit job, get packed, and travel to Berkeley, California, where our uh, training was to be for two months. Right. We managed to do it. Um, I think of the 50 of us who went, there was a, a married couple, but other than that, there, no, none of us knew anybody else. But there was an immediate rapport, immediate friendship, uh, as evidenced by about the third day in, they gave us a psychological exam. And we knew what that was going to be all about. The same question coming up three or four times. You look back, see how you answered it the first time and answer it differently if you were a saboteur like, I, like the rest of us yeah. were. Um, so they had to throw out the results. And, and mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it was definitely a wonderful Peace Corps spirit to, to um, question the, right. the, the regime. But we uh, trained for two months in Berkeley. Uh, they let us go home for four days because we really hadn't had much of a chance to say goodbye to our family or our friends. We re-met in Washington, D.C., where Kennedy had given us, gave us a reception in the Rose Garden. Mm -hmm. And uh, we each shook his hand, and some astute photographer took a picture of each of us and sent it to our parents for Christmas, which was a really nice touch. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Were any videos made of the uh, time with Mr. Kennedy? <laughs> yes, sir. There, there was a video that had a second life. Uh, there, somebody was shooting the whole time we were there, and my dear friend Alice O'Grady, who was also a Chautauquan, uh, was shaking hands with Kennedy and the people who were filming Forrest Gump many decades later had looked in the archives of Kennedy shaking hands. If you remember that wonderful scene in the, in the White House when Forrest Gump has to go to the bathroom and <laughs> says so as he's shaking hands with the president, it worked out that it was Alice's shaking hands with President Kennedy. Really? Yeah, and she has a copy of, of Forrest Gump shaking hands and, and or, or of herself. And then Tom Hanks gradually being superimposed on her image, and, and it worked perfectly, but it really is quite a fun, fun thing to see. That's great. Technology at That's work. That's great. That's great. So how long then were you in, in Africa with the Peace Corps? I was there for two years, as all of us were. Um, some people signed up and stayed longer. Um, I, I did not. I uh, wanted to get on with uh, some other things in my life. I had never taught before, and mm -hmm. there were many in the, in the group, again, of 50 of us who had taught. Right. And Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of independent Ghana, had wisely built 57 new schools and, of course, desperately needed qualified teachers. So right. when the Peace Corps was announced, um, he signed us up. Right. I got stationed instead of at a new government school at a boys' Catholic boarding school that had quite a good reputation. It, had it was an old school that existed for 10 years already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it had an excellent reputation. The, the boys who went there were determined, uh, motivated, wanted to get to, into university, and they had to pass external examinations. By that I mean an exam that was made up in England for my students. We had a set curriculum that I had, to, several books that I had to teach. They, I didn't see the exam until after they had taken it. Sounds like the region system. Uh, yeah, it was, it was scary for a first-time teacher. Mm -hmm. um, but knowing that this was going to happen, um, I put the pedal to the metal and they didn't object. You couldn't give them, well, you could give them too much work, but they were so willing. Um, we had electricity at the school for four hours, but they would get under their blankets at night with a flashlight really? and, and study, right? Many of the students had their tuition being paid by the village. So you can imagine if you went home with poor grades that um, going home to the village would be very embarrassing. So um, we finished what we had to read 
um, early, and that gave us two weeks to, I challenged them to create, I gave them some of the old exams so right. they can get a model of what kinds of questions might be on the exam. And then they were to make up questions, and we together aced the exam. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So let's let's go forward. Okay. You finished your time in in Africa. Did you meet anybody significant during your time there, besides the president of the country? I personally never met met, met Kwame Nkrumah, but uh, I I chose not to go to a couple of receptions because okay. I had other commitments okay. that I was that I was honoring. Okay. Um, no, I went home uh, fairly directly. Um, but while I was still in Africa, a recruiter from Yale came right. and said that um, the Master of Arts in Teaching program was really looking for Peace Corps people, and if um, I would fill out, or any of us filled out an application, he would deliver, hand deliver them to the, right. to the director of the Master of Arts in Teaching. I was accepted by return mail. Um, the interesting thing was that they then wrote a letter and said, would you mind taking the, um, what is the graduate level exam? Graduate record exam. Record, so. right, uh, because we have to fill in that blank. So I traveled to Accra, which was uh, about a two hour trip, and was in a huge gymnasium with a squeaky fan. There were two of us who were taking a squeaky fan going around and, and uh, we took the exam. So happily I passed well enough that I was able to go right. to Yale uh, for a full year and that was when I decided, well, I discovered that that was what I wanted to do was be a teacher. Right. Never as an undergraduate had I considered that at all. Right. right. And then you went from Yale and you found your way to Niagara University, Niagara Community College. Right. Tell us what you did there. Um, I taught there. I, I taught uh, at both for uh, a full academic year, and then luckily was able to get a full-time job at Niagara Community College, where I stayed for almost, well, 25 years. Right. Um, it was a wonderful experience. I, I could, again, deal with students because they had paid their own tuition, were determined and uh, to get a good education, not dissimilar to the, the kinds of students I had in Africa. Right. I, I uh, regret to say that that was not necessarily the case at the university where many students had their New York parents paying for their tuition and would sit there with their arms crossed saying, it's your job to fill this empty vessel. Oh. Go for it. Oh. So that, well, <laughs> so you found it easy to get the students to do writing and reading and all that extra work at Niagara Community College. Correct. I used a text that was a lot of fun. It was called The Informed Argument and had chapters on gun control, the death penalty, animal experimentation, good controversial uh, items about which the student should have some knowledge and opinion. Right. And uh, when, when I would introduce one of the chapters, say it was on animal experimentation, I'd ask the kids to write a sentence or two about their current feeling right now. Right. What are your thoughts about animal experimentation? And they would write down. And I had read, of course, the, the text. So if you said that you were absolutely adamantly never, never, never should there be animal experimentation, I'd have you read two pro and one that would agree with you. Right. And the kids would come into class the next day or after having done the reading, and they would say, ah. And they had gone, and many of them would get extra books by the person who had the opposing point of view. Because That's wonderful. They, yeah. That's wonderful. They really uh, learned that having a, a fixed uh, mental state was, was not a good thing. Right. Now tell us about how you made your way from Niagara Falls, Niagara Community College, down to Chautauqua. Well, I have a wonderful cousin, and she and her husband have uh, a house on the grounds of the institution. And an, uh, another person with whom I grew up, um, she and her husband have a, a lovely home off the grounds. And they invited my mother and me after my father died to come stay, you know, for a couple of days at Chautauqua. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was just flabbergasted. Um, Mom was pretty uh, 
elderly at the time, so mm -hmm. um, I did ask her why why she they had elected to build a, a summer cottage on the Canadian Lakeshore when Chautauqua was was down here. She said, "Oh, it was just too far." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, after she died, I sold their, her house and used that money to buy a house on the grounds. Right. And um, lived there, uh, bought it in the, the fall of 93 and stayed summers and came down on weekends and that kind of thing until right. 98 when I retired and became a full-time uh, resident at the institution. At the institution. And so you have wintered through <laughs> you got the track record of winters in both Niagara Falls <laughs> and in in uh, Chautauqua. Yeah, I will take the blizzard of 77 and the 13 feet of snow we had in Lewiston over this last winter that we just had. <laughs> and I and know everybody who lived through it knows exactly why I'm saying that. Right, right. Bitter. Now tell us, tell us about um, your activities with North Lake and Forum Citizens. You're here at Chautauqua, you're living year-round, you've retired from full-time teaching, you're, you're an intellectually lively person. <laughs> What, what led you to, to convene that organization? Um, there were, were, were two people who were pretty um, uh, helpful in directing me in this direction. One was David Miller, who was a revered gentleman on the grounds of the institution. Mm -hmm. And the other was John Akers, who never lived on the, on the grounds of the institution, but had a lot of friends both on and off, off the grounds. Mm -hmm. And they had formed a a group whose name now eludes me, um, and thought that I might be, you know, a, a, a good spokesperson for them. I had been on the school board and when I lived in Lewiston, New York, and so I, you know, I knew a bit about how that kind of thing ran. But I began going to the school board meetings, the town board meetings, and the county legislature. And um, there were several things that were being discussed at that time that were really of, of great interest. I think probably the, the, the most important was the fact that, and I would go to the county facilities committee meetings, the state had said to the county, your family court facility is so far below standard that we could withhold uh, $12 million from your budget if you don't do something about it. Build a new building, do, do something. So <clears throat> they, the facilities committee hired an architect and they were going through plan after plan after plan. Uh, the, the idea was to tear up the parking lot that's on the north side of, of um, the Jurassic office building mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, and, and use that for the court. Um, I, I didn't like that idea uh, too much because it meant more parking, more trees gone, uh, more parking would have to be supplied, um, and a, a big, probably not awfully attractive new building. Right. I was also attending town board meetings, and guess what? The state told them that their court was in such terrible shape that they uh, would be fined if they didn't establish a new courthouse. Um, so at, I was at one of the facilities committee meetings and they were discussing yet another plan. And I put my hand up in the air and Keith Alstrom, who was uh, legislative chair at the time, but also chair of this committee, um, looked at me and said, Laura, this is a committee meeting and the public is invited, but you're not supposed to speak. And I said, may I say one sentence? And he said, well, yes. And I said, the town has exactly the same problem as the county. And everybody at the table said, what? They hadn't communicated. And once they realized that the town was facing the same issues, that the, the county was, they did begin to communicate. And as any resident who's been here during these years now knows, uh, the town bought the, the old Mayville School and offered space to the county. The county uses 31% of the building and the, and the town 69%. 
extra space yes there was plenty of it it's all been rented the uh, the bond that the town had to take out to to do the renovations that needed to be done will be paid off by the end of this year um, and it was way less expensive than the the two buildings that were being un, under consideration as before they started communicating right so indeed you you served as the impetus to get these two organizations together and uh, and, if, and if they hadn't been if uh, our our county legislator here at the time was Fred Croscott and if they hadn't been cooperative it would have been a futile effort but luckily the the suggestion fell on fertile ground and and here we are right and how would you rate the facilities as they had been uh, how they emerged I think both are first class right. I think everybody is happy the the family court as it was in the county uh, building um, offered no space for client and attorney conversation uh, people who were, had cases pending had to stand outside wait in the hall the waiting rooms were closet size um, and there were uh, evidence there was evidence of violence occasionally um, in those hallways which is pretty awful for children to see mm -hmm. uh, pretty awful for anybody to see so um, the need for the facility that they have now at, at the the old school building is is wonderful mm -hmm. judge mm -hmm. Claire is very happy right right and we're the studio is actually a part of that facility is it not right yes I think we are in the old uh, shop building um, which is a wonderful facility for Echoes Channel 5 and high ceiling good power supply great ventilation air conditioning and the like and no echo <laughs> no echo no echo and right. and, and um, folks like Chuck and, and Devin have done great work in setting up the studio um, for all who are concerned now tell me about your current work and what do you what do you see with the current government situation if you could tell us a little bit about some of the meetings you go to and and globally what your observations are and maybe what some of the current challenges facing local government as you see them wow <laughs> that's that's a big challenge we've only yeah. got five minutes <laughs> it's like when you write an essay for your final exam right right for those final exams um, I just wish people would lift their eyes a little bit more and look at the broader picture and not be so trapped by um, often what seems to me closed-mindedness and narrow vision um, cooperation can get an awful lot of things done and uh, I'm, I'm a great strong advocate of that uh, I, I tend to vote as a uh, the Democrat Party but when there are when I go into that booth it's my vote and I can do whatever I want and I voted for many a Republican mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. any great insights recently in board meetings that you've heard I do wish that uh, board meetings among the schools in Chautauqua County would be shared perhaps um, that I think having 18 school districts in this in this county is uh, way out of line that's that's an awful lot of money for buildings for salaries and uh, with a declining enrollment as my the last figures that I heard is there is one school that is nearly uh, complete in its enrollment and that's Southwestern most of the other schools are three-quarters to half full correct and um, though transportation could be a problem it, it it's much less of a problem than this additional expense that every uh, tax-paying citizen of the county is going through right I think I think we need to open up eyes to the possibilities of the benefits of merger right Ripley and Chautauqua Lake Central School have worked out a very good plan uh, everybody seems happy with it though there was some fear that good teachers would be let go right I think the good teachers were kept can you explain a little further what that plan is between Ripley and Chautauqua Lake Ripley has sent it uh, I think it's 135 I may be wrong about that number of their high school students to Chautauqua Lake they pay a tuition mm -hmm. um, and that uh, covers the additional expense of, of teachers and facilities that are uh, at Chautauqua Lake right 
the transportation was not a problem because they already were transporting students from Ripley to uh, the BOCES, which was right down 394. Right. So they would come down 394 and stop off at Chautauqua Lake to drop off those high school kids and carry on with the kids who needed, who were going, taking classes at BOCES. So right. it, can, it can be done. It right. really can be done. And, and uh, it takes somebody with vision and a little bit of backbone uh, to get this kind of thing moving. Right. And does the larger enrollment than the Chautauqua Lake have any educational consequences? Oh, sure. Um, it's using the building a lot, a lot more effectively than it was, but it too is still under enrolled. Right. It could, it could take um, students from other nearby districts easily. Right. It's new. It's the newest school in the county and has excellent facilities, mm -hmm. um, excellent staff, good reputation, mm -hmm. and um, it should be a good magnet for. Right. Keep, let the, the elementary kids have neighborhood schools. Right. That's, I think that's important to be close to home and uh, nearby familiar things. Right. But by the time high school comes around, I think making uh, Chautauqua Lake and Southwestern possibly, and maybe Bemis, the central high schools, three instead of 18, uh, it it's seems to me would be sensible. Immensely, immensely better. And easier on the taxpayers, would it not? Hello. Yeah. Much. Right. Much. Right. Now tell me what you do for Chautauqua property owners. We had Hugh Butler here earlier in the week, and I, I know you're an ex officio member of the CPUA Executive Committee, and, and I wonder if you could just in the last minute sort of share with us what you do there. I put out a newsletter uh, right. uh, from the people who wish to receive it sign up at the uh, two CPOA meetings that are held during the summer. Right. Um, or they can contact me. The word should get out that if they want uh, the newsletter. And I just keep them up on what's, what's happening at, on the school and town and county levels and in the institution itself, but mostly outside because the, the newsletters that they, they get from the institution are more than adequate. Right. and cover more in more detail than I could. Right. I also think of, of you as, as bringing in some very good speakers for CPOA open meetings. Um, I know I, sh I shot a video of you introducing uh, Mayor, I'm going to mispronounce his name, from, from Jamestown. Therese. Therese. Yeah, yeah. And um, that's a very good thing for, for those outside of Jamestown to see and for viewers of Access Channel 5 to be able to take a look at. This, um, this has been a wonderful discussion. Any last points you'd like to make? Thank you. I love Chautauqua and everything about it, um, and I mean that with a capital C, meaning the whole county. Right. Um, and I, I just would like us all to be one huge family. Great. And not separate. Great. Thank you very much. Thank this you. has been Chautauqua People, and my name is John V, and my guest has been Laura Damon.